Uh, I'm here with Dan Werb, the International Center for Science and Drug Policies Research Coordinator and a member and co-author of studies uh, with Stop the Violence BC. Dan, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks a lot for being here. Dan, I, you and I both know that next week the Conservative government of Canada is poised to pass their very egregious legislation, Bill C-10, the Safe Streets and Communities Act. And I wanted to talk with you about why that bill is so bad. Can you explain what it is that makes it such a, a harsh bill? Sure. So, um, you know, in some ways, this bill is, uh, the impact of this bill is, is actually simpler to predict uh, than a lot of others, because we've seen what the kinds of, uh, the kinds of policy, uh, policy changes that Bill C-10 is suggesting, such as mandatory minimum sentencing, we've seen what they've done in places like the United States. So in the United States, mandatory minimum sentencing for drug crimes has been passed in a number of states, including New York and Texas and a whole uh, host of other uh, states. And they've been in place for a couple decades now, um, and in some cases, uh, quite a lot longer. And what is happening now is there has been a record number of people incarcerated for drug crimes in the United States. And uh, this has skewed primarily towards the incarceration of uh, ethnic minorities, such as African Americans. Uh, currently, one in nine African American males between the ages of 20 and 34 is in prison at any one time. And over one in 100 Americans is actually in prison. And the vast, vast majority of those are in prison because of drug crimes. Now, if that made any kind of a difference to how much people use drugs or how much, uh, how, how large the supply of drugs was, then, you know, maybe there would be some kind of argument, as draconian as it is, to suggest the mandatory minimum sentencing for drug crimes has an effect. But what we've seen is that despite this in massive increase in the incarceration of people for drug crimes, there has been essentially no change, in, no significant changes in the levels of use of, of cannabis, of heroin, of cocaine. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen that the price of cannabis, in, in particular, and in fact of heroin and cocaine, the, the prices of all these drugs over the last 20 years has gone down, and the purity, and in the case of cannabis, the potency of THC has actually increased. At the same time, young people say that cannabis is more widely available to them than drugs or than tobacco or alcohol. Now, when you have these three indicators, so price going down, purity and potency going up, and wide availability, what that suggests is that, in fact, uh, quite the opposite from reducing the supply of drugs, the supply of drugs has actually increased. It's increased so much that we're getting pure and pure drugs on the street. In the case of Canada, there's no reason to suggest that the experience here will be any different. And in fact, it's quite striking and puzzling that Canada would be implementing uh, a bill like Bill C-10 with its mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines, because in the states, everything is moving in the opposite direction. There's, I think, about 20 states that have uh, thrown out their mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines or are in the process of dismantling them because they've seen what a complete and utter failure they've been, and not only a failure, but a social disaster. Right. Now, you mentioned a few things there. You mentioned that, of course, these mandatory minimum policies have a sort of racist edge to them. They tar target minorities. And you did mention, yeah. of course, the large expenses involved in something like this. Or you were talking about the expense of, of drugs on the street, but there are large expenses involved in the legislation itself and putting something like of this course. through. It, can you and and one, of, one of the the shocking things about this legislation in Canada is that the conservative government is refusing to even uh, release much of what they think it's going to cost. You know, the, the estimates 
always increase when things are implemented. When such massive changes like the one that Bill C-10 wants to want to want to implement, but we don't even know what the base cost is estimated to be, and, and frankly, it's going to cost, I think, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, by the time it's all uh, tallied up. Right. Now, you also mentioned that this legislation may have the opposite effect. It, it actually makes drugs easier to get, and of course, in the research, I've read that it will make the streets actually less safe, because, you know, it puts the economy into the hands of organized crime. Exactly, and and that's where Stop the Violence BC comes in because, you know, we've looked at the data and frankly, there's nothing to suggest that the cannabis industry in and of itself creates criminality or fosters violence. The thing that makes it, uh, and, and, you know, to this day, it's it's unfair to characterize the entire cannabis industry as somehow uh, a huge violent enterprise. But we know from data that the RCMP, RCMP has been collecting and from media reports that organized crime uh, is deeply, deeply involved in the cannabis industry. And in fact, the cannabis industry is one of the major, if not the major source of uh, fin- finances for organized crime in BC. And this isn't a product of the cannabis industry in and of itself. This is a product of the criminalization of the cannabis industry. What happens when you've got an industry that is prohibited in name only is is you're essentially, but, but you can't control it, is you're creating a playground for organized crime. And the way that organized crime deals with conflict, the way that organized crime is going to increase its market share through violence, and that's what we've seen across BC. And in fact, uh, you know, we can we can compare our little mini gang war um, and the gang violence that we've seen in BC with that in Mexico, where uh, you know it's essentially the same situation except blown to its absolute maximum proportion, where uh, a, a War on Drugs was implemented in 2006 to destroy the cartels in Mexico. And since then, 60,000 Mexicans have been killed in drug-related violence. And now murder is the number one cause of death for Mexican young people, which is an absolute travesty. And to think that this prohibitive stance that doubling down on enforcement, on deterrence, and on interdiction is somehow going to affect uh, you know, the use and supply of drugs is absolute lunacy. Right. I mean, the science is there. We've we've had Senate reports in the past here in Canada. We've had, you know, other official reports that have really looked at this, and have, they just time and again show the same thing. That Exactly. I mean, it, 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 it's the kind of thing that you don't even have to, you know, run the statistics on. All you have to do is look at the the data that the U.S. government is collecting and the Canadian government, which just shows, you know, over the last 20 years, the price of cannabis, the price of heroin, the price of cocaine have all decreased, while the potency of cannabis and the purity of heroin and cocaine have increased and and increased quite dramatically. And you look at that data and you can see it's evident that this so-called prohibition on drugs is actually just a complete deregulation of the, of the illicit drug market. It's not really prohibiting anything because we all know that drugs are widely available everywhere. If it was truly prohibiting it, then drugs wouldn't be available. But what we've got instead is not a prohibition, but in fact quite the opposite. We just have a completely deregulated market where gangsters can uh, kill and uh, do whatever they need to do with impunity to keep their market share. Into so the wild west of drugs, basically. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Dan, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned Stop the Violence BC and uh, some of the the successes you guys are having there, or I wanted to talk about those successes because you've been able to acquire some endorsements from some pretty big names, some important people. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So Stop the Violence BC, as I mentioned, was really born out of the fact that there's this ongoing gang violence uh, in BC, and it's really linked to the fact that the cannabis trade, which is a huge cash cow for uh, organized crime in BC, 
uh, continues to be illegal. And it's really the illegality of the trade that allows this violence to continue. And so, you know, our our goal is essentially, it's a large public education project where we want to change the terms of the debate. The debate is not about, um, you know, drugs are bad for you, drugs are good for you. The debate is essentially saying, look, you know, we've got enough data at this point to show that our current system is not working. And more problematically, that the current system of cannabis prohibition is contributing to higher levels of, uh, of homicides and gang-related violence. And that message really resonates with British Columbians. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we did early on was we did some polling of the attitudes of British Columbians. And you know what? People are really, really well-informed, not only in BC, but across Canada, about the fact that not only has prohibition failed, but that there are clear links between prohibiting something and not being able to control it and the violence that could ensue by groups who are trying to control the trade in that substance. So um, it's actually been, you know, a pretty, if you want to call it a pretty easy sell, because uh, it's something like only 12% of British Columbians polled said that they didn't want, uh, that they were satisfied with uh our current drug laws, which means that 88% of British Columbians weren't satisfied with our drug laws. Um, and and when you start from such a strong, when you've got this, such strong support from the general public, it's really easy to get people on side, especially when, you know, everyone can see the reality of the situation, like you said. Right. Now, the the general public is one thing, but some of the people who have come forward recently, the former mayors of Vancouver, um, former attorneys generals of Vancouver or of, uh, of British Columbia, if that is, they've all come forward and uh, and endorsed your group. How have you guys gone about acquiring those endorsements? Well, you know, we we're 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 at a very interesting time when it comes to drug policy because we're really emerging from a time when politicians and policymakers would say one thing in private, which is that they understood that the war on drugs was a total failure, but that they wouldn't be willing to say these things in public. But internationally, what we've seen is a real change in that sense, because we've got people internationally, like the former presidents of Brazil and Colombia and Mexico, Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, businessmen like Richard Branson all coming forward and saying, you know what, this is a disaster. And they have the courage to say it uh, in public. And, you know, those initial steps have made it easier for policymakers and politicians to come out and say, you know what, I'm not going to look like a crazy person if I speak truth to power. And really, it, people understand that the war on drugs has failed. It's not something that we have to explain to people anymore. I think generally that support for our current drug laws is at an all-time low. So it, it's sort of a natural fit. And really, you know, this whole project grew out of a public health initiative. And uh, it's scientific experts, it's clinicians, it's doctors, it's the Health Officers Council of BC that are driving this. And that kind of pedigree... Um, for people who are really, you know, they, they see the impact of the drug laws firsthand, you know. Uh, Evan Wood, one of the coalition's directors, he, he got engaged when he was working in the emergency room at St. Paul's Hospital in downtown Vancouver and would see gunshot victims of, uh, you know, victims of, of drug crime. And, you know, you see that kind of thing, and it's going to have an effect. And I think British Columbians and Canadians more generally, and really, you know, people across... North America and Europe have been exposed long enough to these drug laws, and we know their effect. Right, so the climate is definitely changing. And I mean, here. The climate is changing, exactly. And, you know, it, it's the kind of thing that snowballs also, right? So you get an endorsement from one person, and they, uh, you know, they, they refer you to someone else, and every single person coming out and saying that they recognize that cannabis laws and Canada has failed makes it that much easier for the next person. That's right. And, I mean, we saw an immediate reaction after the four former mayors came out. Uh, the current mayor, Gregor, 
came out and said the same thing and finally uh, really sort of put his voice behind that. So uh, exactly. I congratulate you guys on your great success there. I wanted to ask well, you, you why Stop the Violence felt they should focus on British Columbia rather than being something more like, say, a federal organization or in other provinces. Are there plans to expand? Yeah, so, you know, it's it just happens that we're all based in, in B.C. And uh, B.C. is obviously the largest, uh, has the largest cannabis industry in Canada. And we've also got this horrific drug or gang violence that's occurring because of people organized crime involved in the cannabis trade. So the links are really clear there. And, you know, BC has really been quite progressive uh, on a whole host of fronts in terms of uh, drug policy reform, like the implementation of inside the supervised injection sites. And in a way, I think that the climate for experimentation is a little bit uh, is a little bit better in BC, you know. And part of that is because we're so affected by by drugs and the drug industry, and you know things like the cannabis industry. That being said, um, really there are no partners in terms of drug policy reform in the current federal government. They are absolutely ideologically opposed to evidence based drug policy, and that is just the reality of the situation. So it would be a waste of energy to focus uh, this campaign on a federal strategy. However, the success that we've had in BC has definitely allowed for this conversation to go national. And uh, I was at a conference uh, just over the weekend um, for the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and there was a lot of interest in replicating what we've done in BC and other provinces. So hopefully we will see this as sort of like a grassroots, provincial-level effort in a whole number of um, settings across Canada that can then put pressure federally on the, on the government. Very cool. Dan, you said you were a co-author uh, on some of the reports at Stop the Violence BC. Can you tell us about the reports that you were a co-author on? And you also mentioned um, one a future report as well. Yeah, so um, the, the main report that uh, I was a co-author on was the, the latest uh, report by Stop the Violence BC, which really outlines the failure of cannabis prohibition in BC, in Canada, and across North, uh, North America. And... The main point of that was essentially to showcase how, you know, in the face of increasing levels of gang violence, uh, the the argument underpinning uh, a tough on crime, uh, war on drugs approach to cannabis has really failed and led to higher levels of cannabis potency, lower prices, and just has had no effect on uh, levels of use or the availability of cannabis, particularly among young people. And uh, we have an, a report upcoming that is not yet uh, published, but will be published in the next few months, which uh, essentially estimates what the value of the domestic British Columbian cannabis industry would be. So not the export market for cannabis from BC, but it essentially suggests, you know, if policymakers wanted to go ahead and regulate and tax local uh retail sales on cannabis, so, you know, among British Columbians, what would, uh, what would that look like? You know, how much would that generate in revenue? And we do that by trying to estimate what the size of the domestic market is for cannabis in D.C. Wow, sounds interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a stepping stone, again, to, uh, to, for policymakers to take things to the next level. Dan, you're also... Um, a researcher or a research coordinator at the International Center for Science and Drug Policy. Can you tell us about that organization and uh, what you guys do there? Yeah, so the International Center for Science and Drug Policy is a network of uh, experts uh, in drug policy from across the world. So we've got uh, membership, I think our membership now counts about 200 uh, MDs, PhDs, and uh, legal experts in drug policy and related fields, and it was it was created to address the fact that you know when scientists when scientists have come out in favor of evidence based drug policies like 
the supervised injection site in Vancouver, or harm reduction in general, you know, uh, needle exchange programs, things like that. They've been pilloried by uh, the media in a lot of cases and by government. So what we felt we needed to do was create an organization that addressed the fact that within the scientific community, there is consensus about, you know, how effective a harm reduction approach and an evidence-based approach to drug policy really is. And we wanted to create, you know, an organization that could uh, essentially demonstrate how strong this consensus is. So the work that we do is generally overviews of specific issues on drug policy, like the, the association between prohibition and violence, or, um, you know, the effectiveness of global efforts to control the supply of drugs. And we essentially uh, create these reports, and, and they're quite wide weight wide-ranging and international in scope, and we use the power of organizations to leverage them and to uh, get people, you know, noticing. Awesome, man. Now, if people want to find out more information about that group, do you guys have a website? Yeah, that group is at icsdp.org, so icsdp.org. Uh, and if you want more information on the Stop the Violence BC Coalition, it's at stopthevioencebc.org. All right, Dan Werb, thank you very much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it, and I'd love to have you back again soon, maybe when the uh, new report drops. That sounds great, Jeremiah. Thank you so much for having me. All right, thanks a lot, Dan. Appreciate it.